Welcome to Corporate Buckets. I'm David Baga. We are in partnership with the Players Impact. This is my interview with Josh Childress. Josh was a 15-year NBA and overseas pro basketball player. He is the founder and CEO of Landspire Group, one of California's top commercial real estate investment firms, and he is one of the co-owners of the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix in Australia's top professional basketball league, the NBL. Now, before you check out my interview with Josh and all the great things that he has to say, please be a great team player and hit that subscribe button to our YouTube channel at Corporate Buckets. Make sure that you check out theplayersimpact.com if you are a current or former athlete, an investor, an entrepreneur, or executive to see all the wonderful things that they have done. Make sure you follow The Players Impact on their LinkedIn page and make sure you follow me on LinkedIn under David Baga. Thank you so much and enjoy the interview, everyone. I want to dive right in. So when you look at the NBA now, how do you think, because I know you retired from pro basketball in 2019 and your last year in the NBA, I think was the 13, 14 season. How do you think your game would translate now to the NBA with the emphasis on the three point shooting, you know, ever since what we've seen the last 10 years or so with the Warriors and all those guys, how would your game translate? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely would have to have been a better shooter. Um, I mean, the game has evolved and, and you know, the league is now, I mean, it's faster than it's ever been. I, I, I looked at a stat recently and uh, I remember when I was playing, um, the the Phoenix Suns were the fastest team in the league, right? And that was, I can't remember that it was the, I can't remember what they called it, uh, but they were the fastest team in the league and they'd be, uh, the slowest team in the league now. And so when you think about the speed of the game, wow. how that's how that's changed, um, you know, that's just a progression of, of where the league is. Uh, and I remember those games and, you know, Garden, Steve Nash and 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 all those guys. And you were you were tired after that. Uh, and, you know, and so uh, I definitely think that, you know, with the, the three ball being of emphasis, um, it, it still opens the floor for a guy like me who can slash and get in the paint you know, and get on a fast break and make plays. But, um, you know, I definitely would have to, to have been a, a much better shooter in today's game um, than I was back then. When I, see, when I see your game, when I see clips of, of your game from, you know, from back in the day when you were at Stanford and then obviously in the league and, and overseas, which we'll get to too, it, it almost feels like your game reminds me now of a guy like Trey Murphy or Brandon Ingram. And, you know, those guys in New Orleans, they have, I think, like, I think they have, I think, the longest team in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And do you do you see that kind of that positionless basketball with the, you know, not so much the emphasis on the three, but, you know, Trey Murphy is he's about your height, right? About six, eight, six, nine. And just like you, I mean, you guys can both get to the rim in one step. Do you see the wings being like being kind of that that type of standard going forward? Yeah, I, I, I will always say. Billy Knight was ahead of his time. That was a GM uh, for the Hawks. Uh, you know, he wanted to play positionless basketball and he drafted, uh, you know, guys like that. So when I think back to our team, um, you know, it was Joe Johnson, myself, Marvin Williams, Josh Smith, um, you know, and we had Al Horford. Like all, all guys around the same height, um, you know, can do some of the same things, but, you know, he wanted to just have, uh, a team that could wreak havoc defensively, could switch everything. Somebody gets the rebound, they push the break. Uh, and I think that with where the league is going now, I mean, that is the prototypical player. Now, you know, a guy like Jokic comes in and, and shakes that up a bit just with how, how impactful he's been to the game most recently. But, um, you know, positionless basketball ball is, is, is the wave. And, and I think, um, you know, more and more guys are working on a skill set earlier where you have bigs who can pass, shoot, dribble, initiate the offense, run the pick and roll, um, you know, and create problems. And, you know, I mean, perfect example right now is, is Wimby, right? You, mm. you see him at summer league, you, you see how he's <laughs> yeah. did first game, second game, and kind of when he, when he gets, you know, his legs under him and gets more comfortable. It's a guy who's seven, five, seven, six, who can play as a guard, play as a big, shoot the three, um, you know, and, and, and you're seeing more and more of those guys. So, um, you know, the league has definitely evolved in, in that position is basketball and enhanced skill set across the, the, the spectrum of players is definitely here to stay. 
Yeah, he Wim, Wimby really is a real life monster. Like that's uh, yeah. that's what it looks like. Like from Space Jam. <laughs> um, so you know, I know you were obviously you had a wonderful career, and I remember uh, you know when I met you, I think it was in 2012, and um, I remember you were when you were getting back, you were already back in the NBA. You were aside just from being a great player, you were also a great locker room guy, and. You know, I'm a basketball junkie. Obviously, you played the game at the highest level. You had, you know, the most success at the highest level that you can uh, think of as a hooper. The veteran presence in the NBA, why do you think that there's not enough veterans, you know, like yourself? I remember we, I remember we talked to you about this, I think like 10 years ago when you were going, when you were, when you were back in the NBA, like guys like yourself, I know Udonis Haslam just retired. But you look at some of the younger players and some of the decision making that they're doing off the court. Why do you think that there's not, you know, guys like yourself really having that role in the NBA anymore? I think when you when you view your team, and your roster as an investment, uh, it always made more sense to invest in the younger guys. Uh, Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Um, You have older players who. Um, you know, may want to stick around, stay on a roster, but they're also trying to, you know, stay on a roster for the next two, three, four or five years. And that spot is being taken up where they could invest in developing a younger player um, that could help them in the future. I think now that you've seen some issues in the locker room, uh, you know, some behavior issues over the last couple of years with some of the younger guys, there will be a shift to having more veterans on the team. Um, you know, when I came into the league, there was, you know, a team full of probably eight, eight veterans and then, you know, six or seven young guys, maybe a couple more veterans where now that, you know, it's, you know, 12 young guys and maybe two veterans, you know, two to three. And, um, you know, it's it's about having the right guys in the locker room, having the right guys that understand, you know, their job. Uh, and committing to that and not trying to go out and, you know, and take over a young guy's uh, spot. And so um, being more intentional with that as a veteran player is is definitely needed. Um, and maybe some of these guys just don't want to take that back seat. I've seen a couple guys come out publicly and say, you know, I don't know why I'm here. I'm not doing this anymore, um, you know, which hurts having more veterans on a team because they can't accept their role. Um, but you also have, you know, guys that have, that have been exemplary at it, like, you know, a, a Derek Rose. And I'm sure Derek could still play at a high level, but mm-hmm. he's taken on the role of being, you know, a veteran in the locker room for some of the younger guys. And now, you know, with him going going to Memphis, you know, that's another example of, I think, a, 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 an organization that's thinking forward in terms of how they're investing in John Morant by having a, another guy like Derek Rose and, and a few others come in and be a positive influence for him. Yeah. It, it's almost surprising because, you know, as a small business owner and I, you know, we'll get into, you know, obviously your commercial real estate business here, but you know, you always have mentors, right? People that you look up to people that you want to like learn from. So you don't make the same mistakes maybe that, that they made or that you don't fall flat on your face. And I'm, I'm very surprised that the NBA hasn't, you know, really, like kind of stuck with that like program because you always hear that you always hear the guys talk about, Oh, my vet told me this, my vet told me this. And this is, you know, like even, you know, guys like yourself, why you've been so successful. So it's, I think that that's great that the NBA hopefully will get back to that. Um, do they, do they talk about that at the rookie symposium? Cause I know you went through that as a rookie transitioning into the NBA. Is that, is that like a point of emphasis that they talk about or is it kind of like, Hey, you know, do your thing. And just stay out of trouble. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't really talk about that. And um, you know, one thing I forgot to mention is what constitute a constitutes a vet now is is different. Like I had a vet I had Kevin yeah. on my team as a rookie, right? Kevin was, I think he was 40 or 38, or Oof. I mean he's an older, you know, older guy. Vets now are 26, you know. I mean yeah. 27, <laughs> right? So yeah, still um, you know, still relatively young in their journey in life, um, although they may have been in the league for seven, eight, eight years. Uh, but no, that's not something that comes up at, at the rookie transition program, because that's really more focused on just getting you acclimated to some of the things you're going to see. 
you know, this first year, um, you know, and, and some of the pitfalls, some of the ups and downs, media training, things of that sort. Um, and so that that sort of programming is really focused on the individual, not, you know, leaning on veteran players. Now, veterans are around and come to speak at those, mm -hmm. those things, uh, but it's not um, it's not something that I would say that the league is, is leaning forward um, with. So born in Compton, uh, born and raised out there. Um, when did you know for you personally that basketball was not just your passion, but that this was something that you wanted to run with and make a reality for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because growing up, I was not, um, I was not highly touted. I was, I wasn't a kid that, that, that bloomed early. Um, you know, I, I kind of hit my stride my sophomore year of high school, sophomore, junior year. Um, and so, you know, you go through the AAU circuit these days and they're identifying kids in, you know, the fourth grade. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of wild to think about, but it's, just, it's the reality. Uh, and so, you know, for me, basketball was a means to get a college, a free college education. Uh, and that was what I was working towards, you know, as a, an eighth, ninth grader, you know, coming into 10th grade. And then I hit a growth spurt and grew into my body. Um, it really started to just be more comfortable on the court. Um, and that's when I, I then thought, okay, maybe I can, I can make something of this. Um, but I mean, even the ability to turn pro, I didn't really think that I had that, that opportunity until I was a junior in college. Um, just cause I was so focused on trying to just better myself and get my body right. Um, that I, I didn't look at draft boards. I didn't talk to agents. I didn't, didn't do any of that stuff. So when, Josh, when was your growth spurt? Because I know you played at Mayfair High School, which is a great high school. Great players have come out of there. Obviously, you, you know, you're you know, kind of the standard, I think, for that high school. And yeah. when did you hit that growth spurt in high school where you were like, wow, like this is like I can, now I can get to the rim in one step? Yeah, yeah. I hit, I hit a, a growth spurt um, going from eighth to ninth grade and then uh, ninth to 10th grade. So those, those few years. I went from, uh, I was about 6'1 in eighth grade um, and then jumped to 6'4 and then, you know, to my current height now. Uh, but it was also just, I grew into my body physically. I was still like long and lanky and clumsy. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you, you know, there's a progression and yep. you have to fill out a little bit and, um, you know, timing got better. I remember my first, my, my first game of my, my high school career, like I got my first dunk. And, you know, it's just, it's like that progression kind of, you know, led me to, uh, you know, I'd say Mayfair uh, becoming my program, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but it was just, it was, and that was intentional and why I went there versus the modern day or Dominguez or Long Beach Poly. It was like, I could grow into myself here and become a better player, um, you know, and, and do a little bit of everything, which uh, I think was a, a big positive for me moving, moving. Uh, you know, forward in, in high school and college and professionally. Well, it's funny, too, because to this day, whenever I see, you know, I mean, I'm a you know basketball junkie. And whenever I watch high school kids highlights, I'll see someone from Mayfair. Like I know Josh Christopher, I think, was the most the most recent guy. And to this day, in the comment section, everybody always says Josh Childress set the bar. Josh Childress did this. <laughs> in Mayfair. Josh Childress was the guy. And, and I try to like every single one of those. I'm like, yeah, that, that is 100 percent <laughs> true. And so that's awesome. And so 2001, class of 01, uh, you had an amazing AAU team that you were with. So it was, it was yourself, Tyson Chandler, Jamal Sampson, Cedric Bozeman, just to name a few, right? <laughs> you saw, and we had uh, Isaiah Fox. We had Bobby Jones. Papa Fox, had, yeah. Uh, Wesley Stokes. A um, uh, guy named Darius Sanders. I mean, our, our – Edwin Drawn, who was my high school teammate, um, yeah. our entire entire AAU team, our freshman year of college was either starting or in the pros. Like I mean, it was just Jeez. it was kind of just crazy to think about, right? I mean, we just had a squad, man. Uh, all obviously local talent, um, so it was a fantastic, fantastic team. And this was the Southern California All Stars for Pat Bear, right? Yeah, that's yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. and. So, and that was when back in the AAU circuit, that was when those games were, you know, that was when the, the arena, like the gyms were just jam packed, right? It was shoulder to shoulder in, in like a 200 person gym. And you had 
you know, Stanford, Arizona, Duke, North Carolina, Michigan State, all sitting next to each other, like right with the coach's legs crossed, just watching each of you guys. Yeah. That was when the AAU was, was, was really like, I think, at the peak. Yeah, I agree. And I, I talk about this with people because AAU, I think, is, is watered down a bit now in that, mm-hmm. um, you know, you, you have kids playing very specific age brackets, which I kind of understand, but I don't because we were, you, it was 18 and under and you were either good enough to play, you know, 18 and under or you weren't, um, you know, and now they have 14, U, 15, U, 16, U, 17, U. So um, I don't know why they made the shift, but um, those were, those were some good days, man. So 2001, you end your high school career, obviously in the best way possible. You become a McDonald's All-American. Uh, games at Cameron Indoor Stadium uh, kind of gives you a taste of what you're about to go through. What was that experience like? Uh, I, I think to me, I remember being an eighth grader watching that. And I thought that was one of the best high school classes, in my opinion, of all time, just because of all the preps to pros right away. Yeah. And, you know, there were guys like yourself that, had a wonderful career at Stanford, but what was that experience like for you? Uh, Mickey D's was a great experience. I mean, it's, it's the it's stuff that I only saw on TV, right? I, I, I saw the Grant Hills and the Chris Webbers and the, you know, all those guys, that, you know, at McDonald's All-American and I, you know, to, to be able to be a part of that was, was amazing. Um, uh, I didn't get a chance to play a lot in that game, which I, I was salty about, but uh, we'll save that for another day. But um, no, it was it was a great game, I and mean, you, when you, you look back at that roster, um, multiple pros, uh, you know, Eddie Curry, Tyson, Tyson didn't play, uh, David Lee, uh, T.J. Ford, uh, Dewan Wagner. I mean, you go down the line, like it was a bunch of pros, uh, you know, coming out of there. Tony Brown. Um, and we just, we had a fantastic class. And I think, I mean, just Mickey D's is just amazing. And, and, you know, I have, um, I was, I was got, I got inducted into the the local Lakewood kind of McDonald's hall of fame. Uh, and so, uh, even kids to this day will send me a picture on Instagram. Hey, I saw you at McDonald's. And, um, so it's just cool, cool thing to be a part of, man. That's huge. Congrats, man. That's, I mean, not surprisingly, but big time as always. Congrats. <laughs> All right, so Stanford University, you commit, um, play for coach Mike Montgomery. Uh, first of all, what, what made you pick Stanford, and where, where were your other offers from that you were seriously considering? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I, I really, really wanted to go to Carolina, uh, and uh, I had a, a bunch of conversations with Coach, Guth- coach, coach Guthridge, um, and then they made a coaching change and brought in Matt Doherty. I don't know if you remember that. Mm-hmm. that happened. Uh, and then it was myself and a guy named Jawad Williams who were you know, the top small forwards in the country. And uh, Jawad signed pretty shortly thereafter. Uh, and so that that dropped Carolina from the list. Uh, and so then it, it came down to Sanford, Kansas, Arizona, um, UCLA. And um, we had this thing at UCLA. Uh, they were trying to offer all of us, all the, the SoCal All-Stars, so myself. Mm-hmm. Bozeman, Jamal Sampson, Tyson Chandler. Um, they're just every all the recruiting materials that we got was us four together. It was like a package deal. We were gonna do this. We, you know, we were gonna come in and be this, you know, this monster freshman class for them. Um, and then Tyson Prino was like, I'm going to the league. So yeah, that's, that kind of cut that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, went on a went on a trip to Arizona. Um, Gilbert Arenas uh, showed me around and I was <laughs> with him and uh, Channing and, and, you know, you know, uh, just as well as anybody, what, what that was like. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and then, yeah, I went on a visit to Kansas, uh, myself, Jamal Sampson, Wayne Simeon, um, Aaron Miles and Michael Lee had a fantastic visit. Roy Williams, I mean, it was just an amazing host and, and, you know, obviously a, a hall of famer. And then, um, yeah, and then my, my, my trip to Stanford was not like any of those. It was much different, um, but uh, had a blast on campus. And I, I felt, you know, you just have those moments in life where you just feel like you belong and you're supposed to be there. And that's how I felt on my visit at Stanford. Um, you know, had a great, great time with the guys. And I uh, just felt like this was home. What was, what was Coach Montgomery like? 
Uh, what you see is what you get with Coach Monty. He's uh, he's not the type that's gonna upsell you. He's not a salesman. He's not you know any of that. He is uh, very straight to the point, uh, blunt, um, but but good. I mean, he 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 thoroughly uh, he impressed me with his coaching prowess. He impressed me with you know what what he was able to do you know at Stanford with the talent he had. Um, you know, and he was consistent. He he expected a lot out of you, but he treated you like a man. Um, we walk on campus. Our first first uh, first quarter, we had study hall. Didn't have study hall anymore. And it was like you're here. You got in on your own. You you can survive, and you will have to survive, or you won't. Uh, you know. And so it was it was that sort of uh, mentality that I appreciated, and just treating me like like a man. You know, as an 18 year old. Yeah, I, I got a taste of Coach Montgomery's schemes, uh, his like his drawing up plays when he was at Cal. My last two years at Arizona, he 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 knocked our game plan right out of the window and he they came back and they beat us twice. So I, I know how great of a coach that guy is and his yeah. offensive and defensive schemes. And, and I haven't had too many interactions with him, but it just seems like a wonderful human being. Um, 2003, 2004 season. This was the uh, the coming out party for uh, for you. Um, you guys started out twenty six and zero, and for you personally, Pac ten Player of the Year. You guys win the Pac ten regular season. You win the Pac ten tournament, and you were an AP All American. Uh, what was that year like for you, just in general, when you have to look yeah, back on everything? That's a great great question. And and what's most interesting is that I missed the first half of that year. So I had a stress fracture uh, in my foot, and so I missed all of the preseason. Uh, and so, I mean, it's a big, big credit to my, my my squad for you know coming into the pack the pack ten undefeated, right? And and I stepped in and and was able to to help us, um, you know, in the pack ten. But uh, I mean, I mean, it was it's one of those seasons that you just you'll never forget. We had a fantastic team. We played well together. Um, you know, you get spoiled playing for a team like or with a team like that because. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I went, you know, and I don't want to jump around too much, but going into the professional ranks, I'm like, this is not what I just came from. You know, I mean, you know, we are, everybody was looking after each other. Everybody wanted to see each other succeed. We were all a team. We were fighting for something together, um, you know, and, and pro basketball isn't always like that. But um, no, I mean, it was, it was a great season. Unfortunate that we, we lost um, the way we did. Uh, I'm still salty about the referee choices there, but we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll leave that. You know, actually, I'm going I'm to I'm bring it up. <laughs> yeah, no, I, bring, you it up. Bring, bring it up. I want to hear <laughs> this. <laughs> so we lost two games that year. One was to UW, yep. Alabama. UW, um, we lost by three, I believe. And uh, the free throw count was 44 to 11. I don't know how we lose by three, only shooting 11 free throws to their 44. Um, ironically, the same, the same uh, stats for uh, the Alabama game. I think it was 44 or 43 to 11 on mm -hmm. free throws. Um, they aren't that much more aggressive or athletic or getting to the rack, uh, you know, that much more than we were. So, um, you know, but we put up a good fight, man. And to lose those games the way we did was unfortunate, but um, yeah, I mean, that that was uh, some suspect referees. <laughs> well, I remember as a kid, I was in high school when, uh, I think I was a junior, that was my junior year in high school when you guys lost uh, to Alabama. You guys were a fun team to watch. And, and I remember thinking, I didn't have the grades to get into Stanford, but it was something to shoot for, right? Mm -hmm. Like seeing you go one dribble baseline, you know, I think, I mean, I, I remember the point guard at the time, I think it was Chris Hernandez, right? And seeing just him, you know, have like kind of the John Stockton impact. His game was like a college version, almost like a modern Stockton. And, you know, seeing him dime you guys up, you guys had some great shooters. Um, you had some great bigs. I mean, obviously having Coach Montgomery there, it was. I remember thinking, I was like, man, like this is a this is a fun. This looks like a fun group, mm -hmm. and just everyone looked like genuinely great people. That was what I always took away when I watched you guys play. And because you know, when back in the day, when the, when the Pac-10 was you know arguably a top top two conference in the country, right, or top three, and and you stay. I mean, our, for us, those games would come on obviously at six and seven p.m. because we were all local. But those were those, watching that team. I remember I was like, man, like these guys are on a on a different level. And then having that undefeated, you know, that that when you guys started off twenty six and zero, I remember when I was in modern day, we would we would end practice early 
sometimes to watch your games. And we were like, okay, can they do it again? Are they going to beat Arizona? Are they going to beat UCLA? And so I remember seeing that and that was really cool to see, but, um, but yeah, that was, I think everybody was kind of secretly hoping that year that you guys would win the whole thing, even though this is like, you know, SoCal is UCLA and USC country. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember even at the gym that I went to everybody there, I saw a lot more Stanford shirts. And I remember my dad even had a Stanford hat like that year, <laughs> <laughs> like when he was at IBM. So, um, so Josh, after, after your college career, you declare for the draft in 04. When did you know it was time? And what were those conversations like with Coach Montgomery and with your family? Yeah, I, I didn't know it was time until after the season. I mean, my, my, and I have two older brothers that really, I think, shielded me from a lot of those conversations. They wanted me to just focus on, you know, on the task at hand. And that was, you know, as a Stanford basketball player. Um, and so any of the agent conversations, any of that stuff, I didn't have any of that until I was done with my season. Um, so I was able to stay focused and not have that always, you know, in the, in the back of my mind. Um, but the conversations uh, with, with Monty were interesting. Uh, we obviously had a fantastic year. Um, and, you know, he went out to the, uh, you know, the, the, the scouts and just got a, a, a pulse on where, where he thought I would land. And it was a pretty wide range from his perspective. Um, you know, he was saying anywhere from kind of mid first round to early second round. And uh, then the agents were saying something different. And so I had a choice. I had to make a choice, make a decision based on who I felt had a better pulse on, on the league. Uh, and, you know, you couple that with, you know, the workouts that I did, I, I worked out with a number of teams, probably, I did probably eight or nine workouts, um, some individuals, some with other guys. Um, but um, I credit my brothers to actually uh, giving me the flexibility to, to, to do that because most guys, they come out, hire an agent, the agent then pays for all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, you're, they're pretty much locked in. I know that's different now. My brothers basically pulled out their life savings and paid for all that stuff for me so wow. i had the option to be able to go back um if i if I, if it didn't go well um so that gave me the flexibility to actually you know do it the right way and and make sure that i wasn't um you know listening to one side versus the other I actually went through the process and got a real pulse on on the market for myself so um you know obviously blessed to have brothers that could do that um and uh yeah, I mean, that was the biggest part of, of why I was able to then get a real pulse on, yeah, this makes sense for me to, to make the jump. How intense are those pre-draft workouts? They're tough. And um, I worked out for, for, at the time, I think it was a Bobcat. So the, the second pick uh, up to the 19th pick. So I worked out for a bunch of different teams. Mm -hmm. um, some were like the, 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 the Charlotte, uh, Bobcats had that pick, um, and I did those individually. And so imagine like an hour and a half workout, it's just you, I mean, and they're just Oof. through the ringer. Uh, Oof. I had to do that. I went, I did that one twice. Um, so that one was, was the toughest. Um, I'd say if I went through toughest, the easiest, um, Clippers probably was the easiest one. Uh, mm -hmm. It was local. It was here in LA, so it was it was easy to kind of get there, and um, that was actually my best workout. I mm -hmm. Probably with that workout, I don't, I don't think I missed two shots the entire the entire workout. It was like just a fantastic. You know, you know how it gets. Like, yeah, you're just on, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, the process was good, man. It, it it gives you a real. It gives you exposure to what a season is like. I went. I did. I think nine workouts in uh in a matter of 16 16 days wow uh, and so you're you know city to city doing these things and obviously you got to recover and you gotta you know do, doing interviews and dinners and all that stuff so it was um it was a taxing you know period of time but you know it was well worth it obviously and this is this is pre like load management days where this is early 2000s yeah where it's like <laughs> hey you have you have like a day to recover and then you're back at it basically. Right. Yeah, there's no load management. There's yeah. <laughs> no. So uh, draft night comes, you go six overall to the Hawks. Um, I remember that Oh four draft. I remember all the hype was, you know, all the, uh, all the high school kids going out 
you know, like Dwight Howard, Sean Livingston, Sebastian Telfair. And then they have the great college guys like yourself, Emeka Okafor, like just guys like that. And Andre Iguodala, like to, to hear your name six overall with where you came from, what was that feeling like? Oh man, indescribable. I can't, I can't put that into words. It was the, the, the best feeling ever. And, you know, it's a, it's a validation of all the years of work that you put in that now I, I belong here. I, I made it here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pro. I'm one of less than 5,000 in history that have been able to do this and get drafted. Um, so it was an unbelievable feeling. And even better was um, before the draft, my, my kind of draft slot was basically five to 19 is what, what the, the people told me. And so mm-hmm. um, I, uh, you know, I think Devin Harris was a fifth pick. Um, so Devin gets called. And then in the green room, what you can't see on TV is they come to your table maybe like a minute before your name gets called. Uh, and so you see the cameras coming over, coming over, coming over, and then they're there, you know, so I knew. And then um, there's a lady named Krista Chen who was like the mom of all the NBA, uh, and she has a hat. And mm-hmm. So it's just emotions are running, man, and family's excited, everybody's excited. So it was an amazing feeling. Yeah, it has to be obviously just a dream come true. I mean, just to go through that. And so you get taken by the Hawks, um, you know, 0405 season, you know, all all NBA rookie second team. You had a great rookie year and uh, you had um, you guys, you know, were building something pretty cool. You got guys like yourself, Josh Smith. I played I remember playing against him in high school. Uh, you drafted Salim Stoudemire the next year. Um, so you guys, you had some, you had some, you guys had some pieces here and you guys, like you said, you had Al Horford coming in a couple years later. And so you had, I mean, I remember watching your highlights just, you know, cause we were always, when I, when I got to U of A, we would always watch Pac-10 guys. Mm-hmm. At least I did. I made a note of it. I was like, okay, watch this guy here, watch this guy here and see what they're doing. And I just remember you were exploding to the rim, you know, your, your first couple of years in the league. What was your Hawks journey like, you know, your Hawks, your overall Hawks experience, you know, from a rookie to the 2008 uh, NBA playoffs against the Celtics? It was a, a heck of a journey, man. <laughs> I mean, you go from, I mean, I, I won, you know, over 20 games a year, my entire college career, you know, we won most of our games. Right. And then you come in as a rookie and we won 13 games. Mm-hmm. I was like, what the heck is this? Uh, and it was just a nasty 13 games. Like we were, we were celebrating after each win. Uh, <laughs> you know, and and uh yeah, that and then second year we won 26 games next year, and we just continued to progress. Um uh, but uh, you know, I mean Atlanta, I, I will forever be uh a fan of Atlanta and a fan of the Hawks. Uh, I'm just giving it, they gave me my start. Um, and that that four years was just it was fun, man. It was uh, you know, growing and, and building a team with guys that are around the same age as you, um, you know, and you're you're going through the process together, you're building together. Uh, man, there's nothing like it. And uh, mm-hmm. so still friends with all those guys to this day. And, uh, and it was a, it was a, a cool journey. I wish they would have uh, kept Billy Knight, um, our GM, uh, longer, uh, you know, and that that probably leads to me not going to Europe. Um, mm-hmm. you know, but uh you know, Billy, Billy was, uh, I think, ahead of his time and in, in how he how he drafted and how he saw the game. So 2008, uh, 07, 08 season, you guys make the playoffs. Um, I know I remember Mike Bibby was on that team, too. Right. Um, he was your he was one of the main bets. And you uh, you guys have an epic seven game series against the Celtics. And I remember, like I said, we, we were we made it a point to watch you when you were playing that. And it was back and forth, back and forth. And I was like, man, I was like, if Atlanta pulls this off, I was like, that whole true to Atlanta thing, that's going to, that, that city's going to just, they're going to, there's going to be a parade in the city already. What was that series like just as a team? And for, for you personally, Josh, I mean, I remember that you had a huge game six to help force the game seven. What, what was that like for you? Uh, it was, it was electric. I mean, the, the, the atmosphere, you know, Atlanta loves a winner and we playing against the Celtics. Um, you know, if, if we had home court advantage in that series, we win it. Um, you know, just, I mean, everybody won at home, mm-hmm. uh, but I'd say one thing that 
uh, really changed us that season was like Bib. Bib comes in, he just provides a different level of confidence to a team. Um, you know, he, he just came in with swag and it was, um, I mean, obviously he had experience in, in, you know, with the Kings and he'd gone through it before and all that stuff. Uh, but I mean, the series was, was, was fun, man. I mean, we were talking trash and getting after it and, you know, dunking on people and, you know, it was just a, just basketball at its finest. Um, you know, it was a fantastic series. So, uh, I look back on those days. Finally, I I, I still see the the clips of, of Zaza headbutting uh, KG. And <laughs> <laughs> that was young Zaza, right? Yeah, that was young Z. <laughs> but uh, no, it's just the emotions of the game, man. It was it was a fun fun series. It was a good basketball. How much how much trash talking? Because we hear about it all the time, you know. On on so many, there's obviously there's so many sports podcasts out there now, and you hear the stories from back in the day with some of these guys. How much trash talking was Kevin Garnett doing to all you guys in that series? It, he, I don't know if he can play without trash talking. It's just <laughs> it's part of his, it's part of his motor, right? It's part of what keeps him going, gets him going. And part of what made him great was that he was able to, to always have that fire, you know. And and trash talk was was a big part of that. But yeah, I mean he, he was notorious for it. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. So you guys had a hell of a run. And, you know, and I think probably you're thinking like we are like, hey, let's run this back, bring everybody back. So summer of 08, you're you're a restricted free agent. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're kind of you're shopping around, looking at teams. And all of a sudden there's this team in Greece called Olympiacos, which is a powerhouse for people that don't know about overseas basketball. They you know, they, they come and find you and and they want to talk to you. What how did all this happen? Because I have. I have so many questions about this and a story about this too. After yeah. you, after you did what you did, so um, yeah. how how did this happen for you in the summer of two thousand eight to to go play for Olympiacos? So uh, it almost didn't happen, and what ended up happening? I had the season. Um, Atlanta then brought in a new GM. That new GM had no relationship with me, and you know we're trying to get this deal done because. Prior to that season, you know, I was promised. I said, "It said, hey, you stay healthy. You know, you you make sure you you do what you continue to do what you're doing. You know, and kind of here's where we'll slot you in from a contract perspective. Cool. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, and I'm 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 a guy that you give me a task, I can go do it. Um, and so this new guy comes in and is like, that has nothing to do with me. Uh, you know, go test the market. So we go out and test the market, and we come back." with two offers. Um, and I don't know, I can't remember who all the, the guys were on the sign and trade, uh, but it was for, it was with the Spurs and the Suns. Now this was perennial powerhouse, you know, San Antonio and, and, and Phoenix. I mean, these were the glory days of, of those teams. Right. And so I'm, I'm sitting here like, Oh my gosh, I'll have a chance to play, you know, either here in Atlanta or with either one of these two teams. Like this is a dream come true. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always thought that specifically with the Spurs, like I, I was better in a system and I could I could really thrive in being a system player around, you know, some of those guys and whatever. So um, go through that process. The GM is like, no, uh, neither neither of these deals work for me, uh, work for us. Um, so you just kind of have to wait it out. And so, as you can imagine, a guy who has come in, who's been pretty much, I mean, let's take off the court stuff or take on the court stuff and just kind of park it, but has, has been, you know, kind of a, a model citizen for the organization, you know, has done all the right things, has, has behaved the right way, never been in trouble, like all those things. And then it's time to get, get things sorted. And it's like, ah, eh, you know, you're on the back burner. Like it was mm -hmm. a little challenge to kind of deal with that. Uh, and, and then out of the blue, I uh, get this this call from from Olympiacos uh, and hadn't heard about Olympiacos. I didn't know anything about European basketball, um, but met with them at Summer League in Vegas. Um, you know, very professional, uh, great organization, um, ownership group, uh, the GM, all those guys were fantastic. They said, look, just come out to Greece. You know, we can we can tell you all about it, but just come out and, and you know, see what you think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did. And I mean, I was in, in Athens, Greece in the summer. And for those that have been there, you know, for those that haven't, you should find out. 
Um, it's just a, <laughs> it's a cool place to be, man. And, and uh, I realized that, yeah, I, I could do this. Um, so I went back to the team and there was a, a, a little bit of a, a give and take there. And, and finally I said, look, if, if we can't get to a deal here soon, then, you know, I'm going to take this, this, this opportunity. Um, and we didn't, and I, I took it and, um, you know, it changed, I think the mindset of a lot of other players that, I mean, the NBA is the pinnacle of, of professional basketball, but, you know, if you can, if you can make more, you know, and be more secure in Europe or anywhere else, you should take a look, you know, I mean, we all have expiration dates on our career. So. And it's, it's so interesting because that was July of 2008. And cause I remember we were, that was going into my senior year at U of A, we were working out and a couple of guys had decided to come back. And I remember, uh, you know, God rest his soul. Uh, Coach Lou Olson calls a team meeting and there was only like eight of us there. And, but a couple of the guys that were there were, you know, Chase Buttinger, Jordan Hill, and they were going to the NBA supposed to be really next year. And that following after our upcoming season. And, and after you had done that, coach Olson basically said, he was like, you guys need to seriously consider this just in case. And he was talking like to all of us. And he said, he was like, there, like, because of what this young man has done, he's like, really look into overseas basketball and don't feel like that just because you don't play in the NBA, it's not like, it's not end all die all. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember it like Josh, it sent shock waves. I think through like everybody was talking about it. There were football players talking about mm -hmm. it on, on campus in the weight room. They were like, man, like, you see what that guy from the Hawks with the big Afro deal, you signed with that team in Greece. Like it was literally the talk of the, like of the sports and basketball world. I remember for a good month. Yeah. And I remember guys were coming back. Like some of the pros were coming back. And they were working out with us. And I remember at the time, I think it was like uh, Richard Jefferson, Channing, um, Iguodala, Luke Walton, I think Jason Terry, and they were talking about it. Yeah. And so it was so like in that moment, like you're playing pickup with these guys and in between games, like they're, they're, they're talking about this. And, and I'm thinking like, man, like this, this, and I, you know, as a 21 year old, you're like, all right, I understand it, but I, I don't like, yeah. and cause I, I, you know, I wasn't going to go pro like, most of like these other guys, but you see that and you're just like, man, like this really sent like shockwaves in a good way. Do, is there a part of you that thinks that like, okay, like, I mean, you paved the way almost for, for guys now like that, you know, when you see them that like, like you said, they don't play in the NBA, but like they have, they can make seven figures overseas. I think I just brought awareness to it. I mean, guys mm -hmm. were doing it over the years. I think what was different, when I did it was, I was, I was, you know, not, I was almost at the peak of my NBA career. So, right. you know, that hadn't been done before. I don't think I, I could be wrong, but you know, guys would do it on the tail end of their career, you know, as a way to extend their career. And I did it and I was, you know, in the top five of six man voting that year. And then to go overseas, you know, following that was, was different. Uh, but when you look at the decision, um, you know, the decision was was also financial in that, um, you know, I was able to make in three years, if I would have stayed for my four or three years, what I would have made here in five years. Wow. And when you think about the 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 duration of most pro, pro guys, um, you know, life cycle for their career, you know, NBA average is four years. Uh, a great career is ten years. So you have a pretty short window to to, to monetize your skill set, and um, I was able to do that in a short period of time. I was able to offset taxes. I was able to, um, you know, really put myself in a position to then come back and sign the same deal I would have signed, uh, you know, had I not left. And so I had mm -hmm. a two year earnings window that was different. Um, you know, for me, it was, you know, it was uh, a, a big, a big positive for me and, and setting me up, you know, for the long term. So, um, you know, taking all that into account, I feel like I made a good decision. And playing over there, you played there for, for three years, two, two years, for two years. And, and you obviously you win the Greek cup, which is, I mean, that's a huge deal over there. I mean, what was it like just being like going, going through that journey, playing with Olympiacos and then getting to the pinnacle? and winning that Greek cup. Cause I'm sure the whole country must've just like put you literally as like a Greek God. Right. 
Uh, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, so we played, we played EuroLeague, uh, Greek League, Greek Cup. So mm -hmm. three, three different things. Uh, we made it to the final four of the EuroLeague both years and we lost in the championship my second year, um, to a really good, uh, Barcelona team. Um, the Greek League for the local people is, is the most important. Um, and we just, we ran into, a, you know, a tough Panathinaikos team that we just couldn't figure out, you know, how to, how to get past. Um, and then the Greek Cup is a culmination of basically all the different divisions in Greece. And so mm -hmm. you, you know, division three all the way up and everybody plays against each other and matches up. And so we were able to win, win that. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. And, and um, we had a pretty, pretty fun team. Pat Bev was on that team. So you imagine <laughs> you know, the celebrations after that were, were pretty fun. Um, but uh, that was a young Pat Bev, right? A very young Pat Bev. Out of Arkansas? Yeah. yeah. He, uh, he was at my house a lot eating and, and hanging out. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, that, that, that time in Greek basketball and just in European basketball was, was fantastic. Uh, and, uh, you know, I still have a, a lot of dialogue with Olympiacos fans and, and they are, once you're, you're an Olympiacos player, unless, unless you move over to the, the, the rival team, you're always a part of their family and they're always making sure that they support you. I was when I played in Sydney for a couple of years. Um, I think my first or one of my first games out there, I had a big Olympiacos, Olympiacos contingent come to the game, chanting with flags and everything. Oh, wow, they love you, man. Um, so it's a it's a good, a, a cool thing to be a part of. So you do that, and then uh, it was it 2010? You come back to the NBA um, for about three or four years, and you're with uh, the Suns, the Nets, the Pelicans, and um, what was that? that second stint like for you in the league, you know, this, this time around after going through the overseas life? Yeah, uh, it was tough. And, and I'd say it was tough. I, I came back to Phoenix uh, and um, you know, that was probably two of the roughest years I had in my career, just in terms of, of playing, uh, playing time. I didn't play well. Um, you know, I, 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 I would have loved to be more thoughtful around, you know, the type of system I was getting into, um, you know, and, and obviously no, no discredit to them. I mean, we thought that it would work and just didn't, but, um, thinking back on it, uh, you know, if I had to do it all over again, you know, maybe, maybe that changes, but, um, you know, it was a, it was a tough, a tough, uh, few years kind of bouncing around. It was the first time in my career where I wasn't playing minutes, mm -hmm. uh, so dealing with that and, you know, and the mental health side of, of all that, um, was challenging. Uh, to the point where after after my time in New Orleans, um, I was planning on retiring, and and just I mean that's when I was playing up at at uh, 24 and just kind of hanging out and 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 all that stuff. And uh, I was planning on retiring, and then um, ended up actually going back to Stanford to finish my degree. Uh, and uh, through that process, and I was like, yeah, I still got some left in the tank. Um, which led me to play another five years, um, you know, in, in, in Australia and in Japan. So one of my favorite stories of all time was, uh, and I think you know where I'm going with this, in, in 2013, um, you, I think it was you, Jamal, uh, I think Ryan Forehand Kelly at the time, his brother, Deshaun, you guys would always come in together and we would get excited because we were like, you know, at the time we were 25 and 26 and, and I had just moved back to Orange County from L.A. And I was like, man, like we got NBA guys coming into our pickup run. This is great. I was like, how, how often does this happen? And, and not just NBA guys, but like some of the nicest people in the world that like that <laughs> happen to be NBA players. And, you know, and I remember you were always so cool about like splitting the teams up and making it fair. And I'll never forget that night in 2013. I think you played with us for like almost two hours. And I remember the Laker game was on. And, and I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go watch, I'm going to go home, like shower and just watch the Laker game. And then you, all of a sudden you're on the bench for new Orleans. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> and I text my, and I took a picture of it and I text my friend. I'm like, like, no, I was like that. And they're like, no, they're like, that's Josh. I was like, wait, I was like, what? And you didn't say a word to us about anything. And, and I remember we were all like, we were in this group chat and every, everything was just like, every remember every text was, Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> and like what? So cause that cause and, and Josh, that was was that getting a 10 day to uh to the Pelicans at the time? 
Uh, it was, I had signed, um, it wasn't a 10 day. I mean, I, I was on the roster, uh, okay. but um, yeah, I'd signed through, uh, I can't remember when I left, but yeah, I mean, I, I, they, they brought me in on the roster um, and, and uh, I was trying to, you know, kind of find my spot within the team and um, I was there for a few months, um, but yeah. It was because my, my agent called me. It was like, hey, um, you know, they're in L.A. They want you to join them. I was like, all right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I remember because I literally like because the, the, the craziest part was and and then to this day, we still talk about this. Like the guys that I still play with from that gym, we were just like, dude, he literally played with us for like an hour and a half, almost two hours. And it was like, I think at like a 3 p.m. on a on a Tuesday or Wednesday. And then all of a sudden he's at Staples Center like four or five hours later suiting up for the Pelicans. We were like, and that's what I remember. And people were like, did, did he say anything? I was like, no, I never heard a word about it. I just remember seeing him on TV. And I remember watching it with, um, I was visiting my dad at the time. And he's like, why do you keep pausing the TV? Like to look at the bench. And I was like, I'll tell you after. I was like, this is, this is wild. But, but, but yeah, that was, to me, that was one of the coolest things I ever saw. Just yeah. like going from a pickup game with a bunch of like, you know, former college scrubs, like to, you know, and then to go and play against against obviously God rest his soul, Kobe and the Lakers and all those guys. But so you had you had that run in the NBA the last couple of years, and then in 2014 you don't retire, you go back overseas this time in Australia and Japan. What was what was that like for you for that for that last run to close out your career? It was fun, man. So as I said before, you know, that last, you know, three, four years in the league uh, was just challenging mentally. And um, I, I spent a ton of time being convinced to come to Australia. It was like, why, why, why would I go there? Why wouldn't I just stay here? I was still um, getting paid by Phoenix. Um, you know, so it was like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. And the GM there is a guy named Tim Hudson. He was like, I think that I can help you figure this out, you know, and get your love back for the game. Um, and so we talked, we talked for like a month about it. And I just took a chance. I was like, I, you know, I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to end my career with just a bad taste of not playing and not being myself on the court. Uh, and I always wanted to visit Australia. I, I'd never been to Sydney and, you know, give, given where our seasons always lined up, you know, uh, our off season was their, their winter. Um, so it just never had a chance to go out there. And so I just took a chance and said, look, I'll, I'll go out there and get back to just enjoying the game um, and really just play for the love of the game. And that's what happened. Like I went out there and I loved it, man. And I, I loved, I loved hooping again and love, um, you know, just being able to be on the court and make mistakes and play and have fun and, uh, I really, really feel like that was uh, a rejuvenation for me mentally um, and physically. But yeah, it was a, it was a fun, fun five year stint, um, you know, playing overseas. How underrated is the NBL? Very. I mean, and now you're you're seeing it more. You're seeing people respect it more. We've had a number of NBA guys either uh, either come to the NBL, play for a year, and come to the NBA, or guys getting drafted out of Australia or next stars, younger guys like LaMelo Ball and RJ Hampton and some of the other guys come to the league, do well, uh, and, and get drafted. I mean, the NBL is, I'd say, the closest thing to the NBA right now in terms of um, pace of the game, speed, physicality, uh, and it's only getting better. So you retire in 2019, but before you retire, uh, you, you, know, you go into business for yourself. Uh, you start a commercial real estate company called Landspire Group. Mm -hmm. when did you when you were playing Josh when did you think of you know kind of life after basketball and why commercial real estate yeah so I don't know if you if you remember when you came up to Stanford you saw this name all over the place this name Ariaga. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so Ariaga is a guy named John Ariaga. he was my scholarship donor there um, and he was a scholarship donor for a ton of people I mean he was a very mm -hmm. successful guy he was a former basketball player um, and he, uh, he made his wealth in real estate. He, he, in the, I think the seventies, sixties and seventies, he started buying up office buildings in and around Palo Alto and Silicon Valley. And those office buildings eventually became home to 
all the the companies that we know and love the Cisco's Facebook's and you know you name it down the line wow. um and you know I, you know was a multi multi-billionaire uh, but also always had a penchant for giving back to you know to Stanford and giving back to athletes and so as a freshman I got a chance to go to his house and it's unlike any house you'll ever see in your life I mean it's insane uh, mm-hmm. first well, at least for sure for me the first subterranean house I'd ever seen like he had this Wow. <laughs> kind of one story thing that you could see and then the whole house was, was underground. Um, and uh, you you walk down the halls of what we call the Hall of Champions and you look and you see John Ariaga as a scholarship donor for a large number of those those individuals. So anyway, 18 years old, 19 years old, I'm like, Man, I want to do what he's doing. Uh, and so got a chance to spend time with him, understand his business and all that and um, understood at an earlier age that real estate was going to be the lane for me. I'd invested in other things over my career, but real estate was always the foundation of that. And so uh, when I retired, I went and tapped my former college teammate and roommate, Justin Davis, and we started Landspire Group together, uh, focused on investing in real estate. And it's been about five and a half years now, right? Since yeah. 2018? Yeah, well, we, 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 I ideated on it in 2018. We started in 2019. Uh, nice. You know, when, I, when I officially was retired. And, and so besides, and Josh, besides doing that, in 2019, you, along with Al Harrington and Zach Randolph, you guys invested in one of the teams in the NBL. Um, what, like, what was that experience like for you, too, just being a part of that? Oh, it's amazing. I, I mean, uh, having played there for three years, I had a pretty good understanding of the landscape. I'd seen the growth of the league. And then, I mean, just like many people, like you like investing with your friends, right? Mm-hmm. And um, there's a guy named Romy Chowdhury, who's a, a real estate investor here out of LA. Um, he led the charge on it. And then um, I broke my hand when I was over there. And uh, I just randomly picked up the phone and said, hey, Al, um, you want to come to Australia for a month? And so he got a chance to see what Australia was like uh, as well, hence why he was an investor. So between the three of us, uh, well, me, him, Romy, Zach, uh, Dante Exum, John Wall now, and then uh, Nick Kyrgios, that's the ownership group for our team. Uh, so a pretty pretty cool group of guys. And it's the Melbourne Phoenix, right? Probably Melbourne Phoenix, yeah. Very cool. Congrats. So. As you, you know, you've been transitioned, obviously you transitioned into commercial real estate, investing. Um, and, you know, I think out here in Orange County, a lot of people kind of that know you, that really understand you, even if they don't know you, they kind of know you as everyone's big brother out here. You know, the advice that you've given, the just, I think, I tell people all the time, you know, I've been fortunate to play with a good amount of guys that went to the NBA. I've been fortunate enough to play with, you know, guys and pick up, meet people, but there's something about you that as really the nicest pro athlete that I've ever met, you always take the time to really like listen to people, give advice and give your two cents. You know, I've heard it from, you know, guys that we've played with like Jeff Ledbetter, who's a current pro Taylor King, who was, I think an eight or nine year pro, uh, you know, Manny Grant, he played for a couple of years in Australia, right. When you were out there and there's just, there's, you know, uh, there's so many guys when you mention your name, they're like, that's the guy that you need to model what you're doing after just from just an overall work ethic standpoint and attitude standpoint, how, like, where, how did, where did that really come from in your mind? Cause you, cause I think that with, with you, I mean, I think there's, there's a calmness to you that you've always had, at least since I've known you, like, where, where did that come from? I mean, I'm, I'm flattered, man. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's really cool to hear that. But um, look, I, part of it is you don't take yourself too seriously. And Everybody's trying to figure this thing out. Everybody's trying to figure out, you know, how they can better themselves and put themselves in position to provide for, you know, themselves and their families. And and uh, all I generally do is just give feedback and advice based on my experience. And um, you know, I'm always available to guys. I I want to make sure that if I can help anybody in the process or in a process. Um, you know, with something that I've gone through and have experienced. And if I can lean on that experience to give any insights, I'm always open to it. Um, but also I'm just I'm normal, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, you know, I've, I've, 
I've done some some amazing things professionally, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm a normal guy just like everybody else. And I don't ever want people to feel like they can't come to me and ask for advice or ask for guidance um, because I've experienced some 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 things. So um that's it, man. I just always view myself as a as a, a kid from Compton. What's the what's the biggest piece of advice that you have to you know maybe younger athletes? Because I think and, and I've noticed it really the last couple of years, athletes are retiring younger now. And, you know, they're getting into, you know, the, the real estate space, the cannabis space, the branding space, the tech space. Someone like yourself who, you know, is not just played at the highest level, but now you're doing business at the highest level. What, what's the biggest piece of advice that you have to athletes that are transitioning to maybe not to be a CEO yet or run their own business yet, but just to kind of, you know, know that they can transition? Yeah, I think um, biggest piece of advice is to really find what you like. One, one thing that's shifted now versus, you know, years ago is there are so many different ways to make money online uh, and monetize your, your skill set that weren't there before. Uh, and guys are taking control of that. And that that for me is exciting to see, but it's also created lanes where, you know, a guy can, uh, you know, create his own podcast. He doesn't have to go to the ESPN or the, you know, the, the, the cable channels to, to get on TV anymore, um, which then obviously they can monetize or, you know, the video game sector or, you know, whatever it may be, um, you know, leveraging brand and skill set uh, is at an all time high and they're learning that earlier. And so I would say, you know, from your high school years and, and, and on, start to start to learn what you like and then, you know, figure out a way to reverse engineer it, to monetize it. Um, you know, guys are retiring earlier and that's partly because they're making more money now and they, they mm -hmm. can't. Uh, but also, you know, I've seen a bunch of guys be able to create lanes for themselves in industries that traditionally weren't there. Uh, and that's just <clears throat> that's just due to the times, the changing of times. What's uh what's a quote that you either live by every day to get you through the day or that you know you told yourself uh throughout your career? Oh, that is the toughest question I think I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have I don't have a specific quote. Um, um in my office, I just have um just be great. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Uh <laughs> I, have that, I have that above my desk. Uh, and I look at that pretty regularly and, you know, it's be great in whatever it is, um, whether it's being a great parent, being a great business person, being a great, um, you know, teammate, uh, being good on the court. It's just two simple words to live by. Awesome. Well, a couple quick hitters and we'll get you out of here. So, uh, go debate, uh, if you had to rank them, MJ, LeBron, Kobe. Jordan. There's and no... <laughs> There's yeah, no I'm, I'm the, in my mind, but you know. yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, I'm, I'm an MJ guy. I mean, I can't. I mean, LeBron is a great player. I'm, I'm an MJ guy too. Um, sneaker collection. I know uh, back in the day when I was when I was in high school, I was a Slam magazine collector. Um, I think up until 2009, I had every issue in my closet. I had Slam and Kicks. The tech corner. It was always with you, always with Josh Childress, kind of going like that, and in in, literally in the corner <laughs> of the magazine. And and I remember I had heard about your sneaker collection way back when. Um, I, I guess kind of a three part question: What was the how many? What was the most pairs of shoes you ever had? And favorite shoes to wear, and then favorite shoes to play in, all time. Yeah, uh, I never counted the full collection. Um, I had probably at, at one point I had uh over 3000 pairs um, Ooh, yeah it was nonsense i can't <laughs> if i did that um, uh favorite pair to wear right now um it's a tie um between three just so jordan ones um jordan threes and then air max ones okay so that's that's pretty much my entire rotation these days is some variation of that shoe, some colorway, some, you know, yeah. So those three. Um, and then favorite shoe to play in uh, is the Kobe five. It's, 
it's, it's like the perfect basketball shoe. Uh, <laughs> there's never been a shoe. I mean, I, I used to think the, the four was the best one, but the five is elite. So that's the one that does it for you. That that is elite. It's an that's elite the one. basketball shoe. <laughs> Maybe I should try something new, but I, I haven't found anything that 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 fits the mold yet. I love it. I love it. Well, Josh, listen, man, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, where can people follow you on social media so if they want to keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, so um, you can you can find me on on LinkedIn. Um, you know, at, at my name, Josh Childress. Um, uh, Instagram is Jay Chillington, uh, and then uh, Twitter is Jay Chillin. So pretty pretty consistent across the board. I love it. Well, Josh, can't thank you enough for everything. Uh, this has been awesome. Uh, appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, man, everyone subscribe to the Corporate Buckets podcast and we will see you guys next time.